Good morning, everyone, and welcome to University Unitarian Church in Seattle, Washington. It's Sunday, November 15th, and my name is John Luopa. I'm the senior minister here and delighted to welcome you this morning from wherever you may be in the state of Washington or in other parts of the country. It's good to have you with us. I'm here with my colleague, the Reverend Beth Cronister, and our musicians and our tech crew uh, to present this worship service for you this morning. It's a beautiful sunny day here in Seattle, unusual for November, but we're delighted with it nonetheless. I call your attention to several of the announcements that come to you through the e-news or the gateway, reminding you also that after the service today, we do have several Zoom uh, coffee hour rooms some sermon discussion rooms, and there's also one for the care committee. And then also there are some minister greeting lines uh, separately for Beth and myself. Uh, when, uh, if you're so disposed, we'd love to take a minute just to see you and to hear your voice and to, and to welcome you again. In the month of November, we are hosting a, a wide variety of what we're calling November social hours. Most of us have been struggling with being isolated and unable to join together in groups, certainly to join together on Sunday morning. And these are opportunities for you to get together via Zoom with uh, several other members of the congregation. And we in strongly encourage you and invite you to participate in that program. We have a number of uh, opportunities for you. And if you go to our website, <coughs> You will see it right there on the page and you just tap uh, that bar and that'll get you into a place where you may choose uh, which of the evenings you would like to participate in. And if you don't see any there that are able, uh, available to you and you'd like something else, please be in touch with Katie Rentschler. Information is also available there on the website. Let us begin the service this morning.
I call us to worship this morning with these words from the Reverend Max Coots. Let us give thanks for a bounty of people, for generous friends with smiles as bright as their blossoms, for feisty friends as tart as apples, for continuous friends who, like scallions and cucumbers, keep reminding us that we've had them, for crotchety friends as sour as rhubarb and as indestructible, for handsome friends who are as gorgeous as eggplants and as elegant as a row of corn and the others as plain as potatoes and as good for you, for friends as unpretentious as cabbage as subtle as summer squash, as persistent as parsley, as endless as zucchini, and who, like parsnips, can be counted on to see you through the winter. For old friends nodding like sunflowers in the evening time. For young friends who wind around like tendrils and hold us. We give thanks for friends now gone, like gardens past that have been harvested, but who fed us in their times that we might live. Welcome to worship this morning. Welcome to University Unitarian Church. From wherever you are today, it is good to be together. Would you please join me now in singing our doxology, followed by hymn number 203, All Creatures of the Earth and Sky.
you UC friends. My name is Julie Fonslow and I would like to tell you some of the reasons I support UUC. I think the most important reason is because our congregation offers us a chance to pursue spiritual growth in community and from small groups that I've been involved with including Wellspring and Covenant groups and a grief support group to our worship services where we get comforting and challenging sermons from John and Beth and and uplifting music from Dwight and our musicians. It's all very meaningful to me and it's become even more so during the pandemic. And I know all these things take time and money and that's why I make a pledge every year to UUC and I invite you to do the same. And I also invite you to join me in saying the words we say each Sunday at this time. This church is a community of ourselves. Its energy and resources are our energy and resources. Its wealth is what we share. When we contribute to the life of this community, we affirm our lives within it. thanks to Julie Fonslow for her reflections this morning and to all of you for the ways that you support this congregation. Thank you. Would you please join me now in the spirit of prayer and of meditation and opening our hearts 
to the practice of gratitude. For this day and all that it holds, we give thanks. For the heart that beats, that breaks at sorrow and injustice, that breaks open to a love that is larger than ourselves, we give thanks. For a body which companions us through our days, which can both hurt and heal, connecting us to our ancestors and to the body of the earth, we give thanks. For our breath, infusing us at every moment with life, we give thanks. For the earth and her seasons, her beauty and abundance for this interdependent home, we give thanks for family and for friends, for love and food shared, for memories jointly made, we give thanks. For strangers whose labor, love, and commitment make the world a better place, we give thanks for forgiveness and growth and for the chance to begin again and again in love. We give thanks. And for this religious community made up of people carrying this liberal faith, generation to generation. We give thanks. I invite you now to add the gratitudes of your own heart and spirit in a time of shared silence. For all of it, we give thanks. Amen.
Friends, I'm going to begin this morning by sharing with you a poem which I think may be familiar uh, to many of you. It was written by Jane Kenyon, and the title is Otherwise. I got out of bed on two strong legs. It might have been otherwise. I ate cereal, sweet milk, ripe, flawless peach. It might have been otherwise. I took the dog uphill to the birch wood. All morning I did work I love. At noon, I lay down with my mate. It might have been otherwise. We ate dinner together at a table with silver candlesticks. It might have been otherwise. I slept in a bed, in a room with paintings, and planned another day just like this day. But one day, I know, it will be otherwise. I'm going to begin this morning by making a statement that may be puzzling to many of us. And the statement is this, that the spiritual person recognizes that the world does not owe them anything, even if they wish it did. They know that there is certainly horror and evil in the world, and they are aware of destitution and deprivation all about. And because of these realizations, not in spite of them, that person is grateful for the fact, simple fact, of just being alive for the life of others and for the conditions of life. Now, much of society today seems to think of gratitude as a weak trait, a servile quality that describes the simpler Pollyanna-ish elements of society, but not certainly the strong self-reliant elements. In other words, the justification for gratitude is often questionable, and I agree, but maybe not for the same reasons that you might hold. The word gratitude is used in many different ways, some of which have no spiritual significance whatsoever. I'm not talking about being grateful for something I have done, nor for something I have become myself. I would define it rather as a feeling of wonder that I am alive and that I can experience life knowingly and appreciatively. It is an awareness of the abundance in the world of creativity. And it is the recognition that I have been given more than I deserve. Whatever satisfaction I may experience, I didn't create it. I may have paid for it, but I did not create my capacity to enjoy them. In other words, the more universal the things we are grateful for, the the more they belong to everyone, the more spiritual is our gratitude. And conversely, the more our gratitude is for something that I and I alone possess, the less spiritual it is. And this is why spiritual people can express gratitude even in the midst of suffering and tragedy and failure because they have lost none 
of the universal things. Why is it so hard for us then to be grateful in this way? Well, perhaps it has to start with the fact that we think that we do things for ourselves, that what we have got, we got by ourselves. Then we have the fear that some hostile force may take these things from us. Why does evil prosper and the good lose out? Surely many of us have worked very hard for the successes we have achieved. And certainly the forces of destruction often do have the upper hand. But there is still another more powerful reason for our ingratitude. When we are in the midst of so much for which we cannot be grateful, why should we be grateful for the little we have? Well, I'm going to spend a few minutes trying to answer that question for you, and I'll share just a couple of observations. And the first is, <clears throat> I believe that gratitude is both necessary and constructive. The ultimate validity of any value from a philosophical point of view is its necessity. In other words, the value is indispensable to sound living. Gratitude is not a luxury, but is an essential quality of mature, intelligent living. Gratitude requires that a person see the whole picture or as much of the whole picture as is possible, both the good and the bad, both the beautiful and the ugly aspects of life. Otherwise, we would be merely half or less than whole a person. And gratitude is also a constructive value, not a destructive value. It has cumulative value. If you can be grateful for something, you will become better equipped to see it again and to see it as more than it actually is. My grandmother used to say to me that if you see goodness anywhere, once, you will see it again because you have learned and developed the capacity to see goodness, maybe even where other people don't, to see it as more. So the first observation I would share with you is that gratitude is necessary for mature, intelligent living, and it is constructive. It's cumulative. It builds over time. Secondly, we get much more out of life than any one of us deserves. If we possessed only what we could take credit for, we may be miserable indeed. Our minds and our bodies were programmed for us before we were conscious by a creative process, we had nothing to do. All that we have been giving in the beginning of our lives has been given to us by entities, powers, forces beyond ourselves. We did nothing to deserve the gift of life. And then once given it, it's a very long time before we become independent enough to be able to function without the support of other people and other things. I have shared with you in the last two months that my wife and I have become new grandparents on September the 8th. Little Wyatt, we babysit each week and each time I hold him, he's only about this long, and look in his face, I think to myself, he is completely dependent on other people to hold him, to feed him, to clean him, to shelter him, to protect him. If he were left alone, he would not survive for very long. So we are born indebted already to forces bigger than ourselves, you see. It's very difficult to find anything that we can really take full credit for ourselves. And that is a perfectly obvious fact. 
Yet we act as if we get back from life only what we put into it. Now we also put more trouble, we get more trouble than we deserve. But the point is to look at life not as if you deserve anything. So we get more than we deserve. Every one of us does. I actually think it's the profound origin of the concept of covenant that we are born indebted to powers greater than ourselves. With the recognition of this, it is wonder and gratitude. I also think that that is the precondition of all serious and meaningful worship. Worship is the opportunity when we gather together to give thanks and to glorify those powers that have made our lives possible. Third, every person has something and many of us have much to be grateful for. When you awakened this morning, which in itself is a miracle, you could see enough to get yourself dressed, to make yourself breakfast, to get your computer ready to watch this service this morning. I'm sure you, like I, took all of this for granted, but in the words of Jane Kenyon, it could have been otherwise, and someday it will. We live in a life where the most precious things to us are perishable. Persons, relationships, conditions of life, material gifts, they will all fade. There will come a time when the person you are sitting next to today or someone else meaningful to you will not be here. You will carry them in the sanctuary of your heart and your mind, but you see it will be otherwise. They will not be here or you will not have the health that you had or the support that you had. These things you see are all fleeting. Well, maybe we are a little more in touch with the many things for which we can be grateful. And now I would like to know why we are so ungrateful. Is it because we fear being dependent on anyone or anything else is it because we don't want to be obligated to anyone else? Might it be that we are afraid of putting ourselves in someone else's power or control? I've been a minister for 40 years and I don't know how many wedding ceremonies I've done. And it is often the case in sitting with a couple and planning the words for the ceremony one of the first things one of the wedding couple will say to me in the beginning is, but take out the word obey. We don't want that in the ceremony. And I say to them, well, think about it for just a second. Because there may be a time in your life when you will need to obey your partner. You're a young couple, you have good health, means, it may not come now, but in time, it may be the case. You may not have to wait until you're in your 70s. It may be in your 50s and something happens to you and you will be dependent upon your partner who knows and loves you best to make some decisions for you. And what you are saying in that ceremony by saying that you are willing to obey your partner means that you are willing to put your life in their hands, that you will trust that they will do what is best for you. Of course, the concept has been abused in history. Obey meaning male dominating female. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something else. I'm talking about trust and the fact that there will be times, most likely, when you will need to obey your partner I can tell you there is nothing more wonderful in a good relationship 
than to have that mutual affirmation. Are we ungrateful because we cannot trust anyone else like we trust ourselves? Maybe we're just too tired or too busy or too numb. Do we feel inferior or unworthy of attention and blessings and thus not sure we should be grateful? It was odd to me last weekend when so many of us were grateful for the turn of events of the presidential election, but just about everyone I spoke to said, but I'm afraid to be grateful because it could be taken away from me in, in the next 10 minutes. So I'm not going to be grateful. I'm gonna be a sourpuss because uh, you never know. I would say be as grateful for as long as you can be grateful. It's a victory, it's a good thing, it's a wonderful thing. And certainly our religious heritage has given us very confusing messages about gratitude. We've been trained not to look beyond our own abilities for the source of countless benefits and satisfactions, that we look only to ourselves and to no other people. And yet the truth is that rare is the person born with a keen sense of gratitude. It is a trait, it is a quality that has to be developed, you see. How can you do it? Well, I've watched many people do this and I've tried to do it myself. And so in closing, I wanna give you just a couple of suggestions about the ways in which you can learn to be more grateful in your lives. You'll have some ideas as well. And I hope that you'll share them with me. The first suggestion is that gratitude comes by stopping to think about it. It requires intentionality. If we wait for gratitude to come to us, in all likelihood it never will. And to develop the attitude, a person must be intentional about it. This means pausing every so often during the daily rush to get things done, short pauses, and simply reflecting on how much there is to be grateful for. Pause, look, listen, smell, touch, wonders all around us to be grateful for. Any of the senses, sight, hearing, can be used. Mindfulness, training, very helpful in this regard. And if there is intentionality, gratitude will come. Another way is that the everyday and most apparent gifts are the good ones to notice first, not to look for the spectacular and the supernatural. It helps to begin by reflecting simply on the gift of human life. Grateful people often pause to marvel at the fact that they are life come to consciousness or more marvelous still, that they are made of the same energy of which a chair or a tree or a star is made. Only they are made in such a way that enables them to understand and to wonder and to analyze that kinship, that similarity. Easy to do with animals, isn't it? Your cat in your lap, your dog on a walk, other people, the sky, the wind speaking to us. Third, gratitude grows with the realization that the world owes us nothing. I think you're gonna disagree with this one. Grateful people accept that the world is not made for them. This goes against the grain. We are used to thinking about the rights of people and the obligations of society to the individual, guaranteed minimum standards of living and similar responsibilities. We think that each child is born into the world with certain claims on society regardless of color, sex or creed or any other identity. And this is as it should be. But let us not forget that those rights are artificially created 
rights by human beings for human beings. They do not exist anywhere else in the world. In naked reality, no one is born with a promise that he or she or they will be able to feed themselves, to see, to live out a certain number of years. They have absolutely no claims on nature or God or humanity or anything else. They possess no assurance even that life will continue just because life has for so many millions of years is no guarantee that it will continue. An awareness of these facts causes bitterness among many thinking people. And that bitterness is irrational. It supposes that we could have expected otherwise when life has always been this way. The more a person realizes that life is a hazardous adventure on a small planet on the outskirts of a great galaxy of which there are millions, the more they try to keep any hour slipping by without gratitude for the gifts that makes experience possible. Another way to develop gratitude is deprivation and loss can make the learning more profound. Gratitude does not require that we experience misfortune. It develops faster and more fully when we suffer losses or the threat of loss. A person who has not lived under a dictatorship may be slow to appreciate freedom. I think we've seen an example of this in the most recent election. Many people afraid of what was at risk by continuing things as they were. It needed to be stopped. This is something too that comes in the aging process. Not that younger people cannot do this because there are many younger people who have experienced very serious loss. But as you accumulate years, you accumulate losses to the point where you recognize that life is transient, perishable. We must enjoy the moments for what they are when we have them. What a goal it would be on one's deathbed not to be afraid of what was coming next, but to be possessed by gratitude for the sheer gift of having lived at all. Another way is any victory is worth celebrating. You have to acknowledge victories when they come. Ordinary accomplishments are worth celebrating. Just do a little bit better today and celebrate. And lastly, a spiritual person always has enough. They realize that if they don't have it now, they never will. It is a great scandal to compare the meager meal for which a person may be most grateful to the whining American who won't eat at a banquet because the food has too much saturated fat in it. And the grateful person always gets more. I have never seen a person who was grateful for having enough who did not get more. And the contrast between this rule and the laws of materialism is so stark that many will find it hard to believe. Yet I am convinced that anyone can confirm it by trying it. Gratefulness for what capacity a person has to love will surely lead to their becoming aware tomorrow of more ability to love. Sometimes we operate with a zero-sum game. I have only so much love to give. I love my child, but I'm not sure I could love another child as much as I love this child. But if you are a grateful person, you will recognize upon the birth of the second child that you had more love in you than you ever could have imagined. 
And the reverse is true too. If you don't have it now, you won't have it later. If you see no miracles in life today, you won't see them tomorrow. We hear a lot about spirituality today. People are looking for it in all kinds of strange places. They think it has to be extraordinary or esoteric, that they need to reclaim ancient traditions that are repackaged for modern consumption. I think a lot of that's rubbish and a waste of time. To be grateful comes closer than any other quality I know of describing the truly spiritual person. It has an endlessness to it. For the last minutes of a grateful person's life are as beautiful as any other. Yes, we need to work on it. Lapse occasionally into ungratitude, but leave it behind and make it a growing edge. And celebrating the fact that a simple, ordinary life is full of miracle and mystery abounding and can be wondrous indeed. So may it be. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is Hail the Glorious Golden City. Friends, I invite you again to join us after the service, if you can, for one of our Zoom uh, coffee hour gatherings and, and encourage you again to participate in the November social hours that will happen really throughout the month of November. Uh, they've already started uh, last Friday night 
uh, an opportunity for you in a smaller group just to get to know other people here at UUC, to see them, to talk to each other. It's pro for primarily social purposes and helping to weave the bonds of connection among us. If you see God, may God be with you. If you embrace life, may life return your affection. If you seek a way, may a path be found and the courage and companionship to take it step by step. Amen. Have a good week. Oh